I am Dr. Swanee Jett, and I have a passion for public health for over 30 years. Now, I'm in a position to affect change. And these are the critical conversations about health and our community with the people who can help me make those changes. Good morning, I'm your host, Dr. Swanee Jett of CEO of Live Talks. And today I have a special guest on my set, Mr. Kevin Fields. Welcome to the set, sir. Thank you, Dr. Jett. It's an honor to be here with you. Well, as I customarily do, um, I actually ask people to unfold and tell a little bit about where you come from and um, a little bit about your family structure. So, Yeah, absolutely. I, I uh, am a lifelong Louisvillian, mm -hmm. born and raised here in the heart of the city, um, third generation public housing resident, um, raised between two public housing villages, Shepherd Square, where my mother was one of nine uh, who grew up there. Um, and my mother moved my family um, to Beach Terrace in 1962. Okay. So I've, I've lived in and worked and worshiped in uh, the Russell neighborhood for all of my formative years. Mm -hmm. Growing up here, uh, went to public schools, of course, from Corridge Taylor to the old Russell Junior High and then Central High School, class of 1976, um, which is a significant year because that was the first year of desegregation plan here in Jefferson County, uh, where we uh, entered into this era of busing, forced busing, they called it back then. And so those challenges still plague us today. You know, these transporting children around the county is flat, has come up as an issue. But I've lived through all of that. Um, um, went to WKU upon graduating high school. Uh, was there in Bowling Green for a period of time, first as a business major. And then I got into engineering. I moved into the civil engineering track down at WKU. Um, my wife uh, now, who is now my wife, was my girlfriend back in those days, Sherry. She and I went to high school together, in fact. But we actually went to, through college together and graduated together there. Uh, her background in industrial engineering, mine was in civil engineering. And so when I graduated uh, college in 1982, I immediately went to work at the airport authority. Okay. And at that time, Louisville as a community was building the new airport terminal. Mm -hmm. um, we had the old Lee terminal back in those days, and now we have what is called Muhammad Ali International Airport, and that was built back in the mid 80s. Um, so I've done a lot. As far as family structure, uh, I'm married, uh, one son, KJ, who's. Uh, I like to be called KJ. Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> Kevin Jr., of course. and. He goes by KJ, and um, the, the, the issue was when he was born, my, my wife and I decided that he wouldn't be called Little Kevin. Right. So, right. so we went with KJ, and he's doing really well as a professional. Uh, he's a psychologist and uh, working to become a licensed therapist and doing great work in the, in the school system and in the community throughout. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, okay. You know, you talked a little bit about growing up and moving from Shepherd Square to Beach Terrace, you know, how was the neighborhood then? Oh, it was, um, it was joyful as a child growing up in public housing. Uh, so, cause we, you never hear people talk about it was joyful. Oh, it, it was, it was for a kid growing up. Um, it was, um, it was a village. Uh, everybody was close knit. Mm -hmm. We had a few strays, you know, we had our issues, but it was rare that we had incidents. It was uh, a safe community, so safe mm -hmm. that we did not uh, lock our doors. I mean, 24 okay. sevens, the doors could be unlocked okay. because children and, and uh, could come and go, mm -hmm. you know, uh, at will. And um, everybody knew each other. And everybody looked out for each other. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, friends to this day that I cherish because of my uh, growing up. And what uh, years was this? Well, I was born, just not to date myself, in the, in the late 50s. So this would have been uh, through um, 
through the 60s and the 70s. Okay. Uh, between, you know, time I was a kid till I graduated you high know, school. You know, I, the reason I say that is because that time frame in Chicago, I'm sure was a little bit different in terms of our projects. Yeah, public probably housing. so. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've studied public housing. I worked in public housing for 14 years and I studied uh, urban planning. And I'm familiar with the Robert Taylor Homes and the Caprini Greens and, Caprini Green, and those yeah. various um, developments that were high rises. Right. And 26 stories in there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a whole different culture and vibe and, and, and uh, environment uh, to raise, uh, you know, low income families in poverty. And I can imagine it was much different. But here we were always the barrack style uh, public housing. We did have high rises for seniors. Mm -hmm. When you look at the Dosker Manors and Avenue Plazas and so forth. But for children and families, it was the Shepherd Square, the Beach of Terrace, the Clarksdale's, Parkway Place, mm -hmm. Carter Homes. And the, while there were challenges, uh, when you look at it through the lens of a child, it was excitement. You know, you look forward to your friends and getting out on the playgrounds and playing. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody was close knit. And so now it was a joy growing and, up. And you probably didn't have as much, probably, if any, drugs or guns. Back in those days, we it was rare uh, to hear a gunshot. You would hear them maybe two or three times a year, maybe. Certainly mm -hmm. uh, that bar in New Year's, of course. But, you know, it, it was great growing up. Um, the playgrounds were safe. Uh, children had a good time, and we just grew up. and And to this day, you know, the best time that we have is, is when you have reunions and come back. You know, more often than not, it's at a funeral or a visitation for somebody. But it brings us back together, mm -hmm. and uh, it's always great to reconnect with childhood friends. And um any brothers and sisters? I have, uh, yes, I have. That's a good question. Um, my mother had my brother and I, uh, William, uh, we called him Billy, and Karen Sue, my sister. My dad, um, in total, have eight siblings. Okay. And so my dad had another um, six children, mm -hmm. including my brother and I. Um, uh, he had uh, six total. Um, and of course, they're all over the country, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I mean, I understand you would live with your mother, but did your daddy have any influence or was he involved? You know, I, my dad uh, my, and my mom were married up until maybe I was about two or three years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had a short marriage and my mother remarried. Um, okay. And she remarried. She married William Page. And if you're familiar with the Page family here in Louisville, you know Greg Page. He was a fighter. He was my cousin through through that marriage. And so, yeah, um, the step my stepdad raised us through those formative years in Beecher Terrace. But my dad was still in my life, okay. although he moved um, to Indianapolis after a while. Hello, I'm Dr. Swanee Jet. Please make sure you visit one of our five locations, not only in Louisville, but outside of Louisville and surrounding areas. Thank you. Hi, I'm Destiny. I'm the Community Health Workers Manager here at Park Duval Community Health Center. This is my team of community health workers. Community health workers close care gaps, reduce barriers to care, and address health disparities in our community. Community health care workers act as a bridge between the patient and the provider to stay engaged in the health care plan. CHW strives to work as committed care team members for PDCHC for current patients and to provide access to those who need a new medical home. For more information, please visit pdchc.org or visit one of our centers. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Swanee Jett, CEO for Park Duval Community Health Centers. We conduct WIC, nutrition, and open enrollment for healthcare. So this is a one-stop shop facility for everybody in the community. 
so who sort of gave you your experiences and gave you the know it all to choose the pathway that you did? Because somebody had to be a major influence. Well, you know, first and foremost, give God the glory and the praise. Uh, I learned to pray as a child and mm -hmm. accepted Christ at the age of 11. And um, I stayed steady and focused on uh, letting God lead me and helping me to make decisions and move okay. forward. In terms of individuals, um, I grew up with a bunch of uncles that I looked up to. Um, and um, my, my grandfather was in my life for a period of time up until he passed away. He was a role model as well. Uh, my dad was... Uh, a provider, you know, he made sure that he looked out for our needs. And so I had a lot to look up to mm -hmm. growing up in, in this community. Um, but I would say in terms of influencing me from a career pursuit standpoint, uh, I had a lot of peers that I associated with from my high school days. Mm -hmm. And we all made a pact that we were going to college. Okay. And that was probably the best decision I made just to put me on a career path because I really matured during the six years that it took me to get a bachelor's degree mm -hmm. at Western Kentucky University. Mm -hmm. And I realized then that um, I had some choices to make, you know, whether I go forward or go back. And there wasn't a lot of excitement to go back to where I came from, right. from an economic standpoint. So I, I chose a career and uh, I was blessed, you know, give God the glory with intellect and where I could learn mm -hmm. and uh, achieve as a student. And I made the best of that. So would it be safe to say you might have been the first of your generation or your family to get a degree? Um, I had my aunt, Retha, who is my mother's youngest sister, okay. was actually the first uh, okay. in my lineage to get a degree. In fact, she went, she got a scholarship to Stanford University, uh, Alice Shepard Square, to Stanford University, wow. got a degree in mathematics, and she was a great influencer uh, of me as a child. Um, and then I had some cousins who were a bit older than me mm -hmm. who went to college before me and got degrees. Okay. In terms of, you know, my siblings, I uh, probably was among the first. Okay. So you, I would say overall, <laughs> you yeah. was about the fourth or fifth. Yeah. yeah. Which that is, that is pretty good. Yeah. So you came up in a time when um, we started to segregate um, and actually busing. Yes. How did that impact you as a, as a, by this time you was going into middle school, I'm assuming? Yeah, actually I was uh, approaching my senior year of high school, of high school. Okay. Uh, when busing went in 1975. Okay. And I was uh, at Central High School. And, uh, you know, the busing um, issue when it first came at us at students, we didn't really know what to expect. Mm -hmm. It was an issue of whether or not you were going to be bused or whether or not you were going to experience being in all black school that all of a sudden becomes integrated. Right. And that was my story because uh, I didn't have to be bus because they didn't bus seniors. Oh. And I was at Central High School and Central traditionally was all black school. And um, so we had integration to happen where we had white students for the first time that we um, went to school. And, and for my experience uh, with, I had never went to school with a white person except for one, uh, in, well, there was one white boy in my elementary school. And, uh, but other than that, I had never had an experience of going to school with, with whites. And so it became a thing of looking at learning a little bit different, mm -hmm. you know, uh, looking at learning from a standpoint of one, you know, doing enough as a student amongst your peers as African-Americans you know, keeping mm -hmm. pace, right? you know, doing enough to keep pace, mm -hmm. wasn't so bothered with, you know, achieving high right. uh, at a high level. But um, when I started seeing white students and their interaction in classrooms, I began to think a little different about education. Mm -hmm. And of course, that only happened for me for one year. But then when I went to Western Kentucky, it was a predominantly white institution. So that, that last year of high school kind of got me prepared for going into environments, learning environments where the majority was white at mm -hmm. WKU. And I tell you, it was a bit of a culture shock from an education standpoint because, you know, I was always a average to mid student 
I would say C, B student, occasional A here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't because I didn't have the intellect. Was the, that was because of my effort. You know, right. I had had right. other things that would distract me from being a high performer. Right. And I actually became a high performer as a student in college. You know, and that was you know for a few reasons, of course, uh, but it had a lot to do with me uh, benchmarking myself against my peers who were predominantly white and understanding that, you know, that was the market that I needed to compete with. Competition. Yeah. Yeah. Man, <laughs> so, sharp and iron. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. So that's what, what happened for me as a student. So, you know, I'm curious, um, because we always hear the stories of black students being integrated into white schools and the reception that they received. So from your lens as a senior, what reception did white students receive coming to Central? Wow, that, it was mixed. Uh, I think most, the majority of black students were kind of numb to that change, meaning they didn't kind of went along with the program. Mm -hmm. But there were some that uh, took issue with it. And there was a lot of racial tension in those days. Mm -hmm. And then when news reports um, came to us about what was happening to black students out at the white school where their buses were getting stoned and uh, there was some real tension, there was a little bit of retribution for some. So there were incidents, not many, but there were incidents where the white students, uh, especially early in the year, mm -hmm. were accosted, okay. you know, confronted, harassed. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think it mellowed out as the school year went along because, you know, we got to know each other and mm -hmm. began to, uh, I guess, assimilate in a way. But um, that first year, and I will, I do need to mention this, uh, my wife who um, was bused to J-Town okay. and she was at Central, she was a year behind me in high school, but she was bused. Um, she ended up on the front page of the newspaper because her bus, which was going out to J-Town, was featured as they were leaving uh, school. Mm -hmm. And um, she, um, that picture, that same photograph of her and a few other students looking out of the bus has been featured on the front page of the Courier ever since as a memorial to the desegregation mm -hmm. plan. So every time there's a 20 year, 25 year, 40 year flashback. They use the same they photo. They use the same photo, and she's right there in the center. So um, I call her a civil rights icon because of that. But um, I, I think we, we got past it. You know, one of the things, Dr. Jed, that I'll say about uh, my perception of the busing mm -hmm. uh, movement initially, I was optimistic, and for a long time, optimistic that busing was good for, for black students. Mm -hmm because you know it wasn't uh, uncommon that we, and we knew that our facilities were not as good, right. that our books were not as good, our books were tattered. You know, our desks had all kinds of graffiti all over it. And it was, you know, but we had pride. We still had pride. Right. But we felt that, well, if we get a chance to get access to the best books and the best facilities, then that's gonna help us to achieve. And, um, in my professional pursuits as I've worked in education spaces at the Urban League for a period of time, I was the education director there and became the VP of programs there. And, um, and so the achievement gap is something that we've worked on for many, many years. And we haven't seen much movement uh, mm. in terms of what the data says about the gap, right? Mm. So um, while I was optimistic, in hindsight, I don't know empirically if we can say that there was a benefit. And I think that's a part of the big debate that's underway today. Uh, is there a reason in your mind that there still is a gap? Well, I certainly have uh, uh, opinions about that. I've done a lot of research in that space as well. Please share. Yeah, so the gap is, is empirically based in terms of student achievement, and we used to base our research around looking at the difference between, you know, um, these uh, standardized test scores when you look at 
you know, reading and math scores compared, whites compared to blacks. And there was significant difference uh, in that. And my theory became, uh, and I used, I based my theory on my own experience mm -hmm. in terms of what it took for me to become a average to mediocre mm -hmm. student to a high achieving student. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a nutshell, I felt like it was motivation, intrinsic motivation. Okay. You have to be motivated and inspired. Okay. And sometimes it, you got to find triggers to inspire you. Mm -hmm. And, and so I question whether or not the predominantly white um, school district, uh, predominantly white in terms of um, you know, faculty and staff in these schools where, you know, I did research a few years ago at the league and found that I think it was over 80 percent of the faculty at JCPS was white. While at the same time, um, nearly 50 percent of the students were black. Mm -hmm. And so what that meant in is that most black students or a significant number of black students were going to be educated by whites. And so the question becomes, do those white educators have that ability to flip that intrinsic motivation switch on for these children mm -hmm. so that they begin to realize their talents and demonstrate that as a student? And, uh, you know, when you look at, you know, the achievement rate that's low, the dropout rate that's high, um, it, 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 it leaves a question, you know, it leaves an unanswered question is what's missing, what's missing. And I've seen, you know, as a, as a community based leader providing out of school time programs for kids where we have seen kids go from being mediocre to high achiever simply because we found ways to flip that motivation switch on for them. Mm -hmm. You know, we do that through the arts at LCCC. We do that through leadership training. Mm -hmm. We do that through giving them exposure and, and um, acknowledging their success when they are successful. And that's what I think, you know, that's just a human thing. In order to achieve your best, you got to have intrinsic desire and motivation to do your best. We are here uh, in the community. We partner with our community health workers uh, to run vaccination clinics throughout the city of Louisville, uh, specifically downtown in the West End. Uh, the importance of events like these is that uh, a lot of people have transportation issues. So we are able to come out into the community and get people the vaccinations that they need. So it's really important to have um, these type of events uh, in the community because, you know, as we know, uh, when COVID and flu season comes around, our underserved communities are hit the hardest. Um, so if we can bring any vaccines or anything that they need, glucose testing, it's important to meet people where they're at. At Park Duval, we care about the community. We do events like this monthly because we are the community and we love to give back to the community. Be sure to visit our website for more of our upcoming community outreach events. For more information, visit us online at pdchc.org. Every kid isn't motivated the same. Just like you, you're coaching a football team, you have to find out how to get the best out of each player. Um, and I think at one point at JCPS, you have 70% of white women in the school system teaching young black men, which you saw most of the issues of dropout rates had to do with that relationship. How can I teach that student? And what is the teacher saying to that student to motivate that student? Um, and I've only noticed because I've raised kids in the system and boys, my boys were treated different than my girls. They were easily um, dismissed as being intellectual. Yeah. So they were not stimulated the same. But my girls were given all the opportunities and they were pushed. Um, and also, when my boys reached a certain age, I felt that the teacher felt more threatened or they were easily to say that they had disabilities or learning disabilities. In fact, one of my sons I really had to fight for in order to say, well, I think you're testing wrong. Um, and he's now in college. So they gave, they were trying to um, speak out loud his inability to be successful in school, which was astonishing. Yeah. And then I got a little kid now, um, 
they said she had a, a speech impediment. And then I says, impossible. She speaks fast, like her daddy does, yeah. um, and very fluent. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, me and my wife challenged that, they went back and said, oh, I bad, we gave you the wrong student score. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that parent as an advocate in the school system to say, no, you're projecting something on my kid that isn't true, um, this is how we end up with some of the issues we do. I agree with you 100%. Uh, parents do, or kids do need advocates, and ideally that's the parent. Uh, and I think all too often the reality for some kids is that they don't have that strong parent advocate. Um, and you're right, too, in your assessment of the, the statistics around the faculty being predominantly white female. Mm -hmm. uh, same statistic I found was over 70%. Uh, white female, and at the same time, uh, you look at the achievement data, it's the African American boys that are at the bottom of the rung. Mm -hmm. And so there's certainly um, a disconnect at some level there, and that's no, no indictment against uh, a white female teacher's ability to teach African American individuals. And I say that individuals because it's the girls and the boys that, you know, the boys are at the low and then it's the girls, African-American, that are just a little bit ahead. And so there's also there's a racial and a gender disconnect mm -hmm. there. And um, so how do we do that? How do we address that? It, it, most people will say, uh, and I think you're alluding to it, it does start at home. It does start with having that family structure that advocates for education. I used to, you know, we had a parent leadership academy at the Urban League, and we trained parents on how to be great advocates, how to approach a school, how to become active in PTAs, uh, and it, it starts, and, and what their fundamental responsibilities are. And I used to say, your basic, basic responsibility as a parent is to set expectation for high achievement. You don't have to you know, be the teacher. You ain't got to know all the math. And a lot of the parents will say, I don't know that new math they're teaching. And, and well, you, you don't, but you can expect your child to learn it mm -hmm. and to, you know, do well at it. Because the thing about a, a child and a parent, most children want to see their parents happy and proud of them. And so when that, when that parent sets the expectation that, yeah, I expect you to bring in some good grades mm -hmm. and I'm going to reward you when you do and I'm going to admonish you when you don't, then that really sets the relationship that needs to be in place mm -hmm. between the parent and the child in, in terms of education. So it sets the standard. Sets the standard. <laughs>